Hello, I'm Helen Lingard from the School of Property Construction and Project Management at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm Payam Pirzadeh from the School of Property Construction and Project Management at RMIT University in Australia. Today, we'd like to share with you our thoughts regarding the implementation of prevention through design in the Australian construction industry. Our presentation covers the PTD policy and legal context here in Australia, practical challenges associated with the implementation of PTD in the Australian construction industry, and consideration for improving PTD performance and outcomes. The Australian Work Health and Safety Strategy 2012-22 to provides a national framework that guides work health and safety activity across Australia's six states and two territories. The strategy was developed following two years of consultation with regulators, governments, unions, employer organisations, industry groups, safety organisations and the general public. It establishes targets for the reduction of work-related illness, injury and death and is underpinned by two principles. First, that all workers, regardless of their occupation or how they are engaged, have the right to a healthy and safe working environment. And second, that well-designed, healthy and safe work will allow workers in Australia to have more productive lives. The strategy identifies seven action items, one of which is healthy and safe by design. It also identifies construction as a priority industry for work health and safety improvement. The definition of healthy and safe by design provided in the Australian Work Health and Safety Strategy is very broad. It states that the most effective and durable means of creating a healthy and safe working environment is to eliminate hazards and risks during the design of new plant, structures, substances and technology, and of jobs, processes and systems. The strategy also states that good job design and management support sustainable return to work when workers have been injured and can help workers to remain at work while recovering from injury or illness. Managers are identified as having an obligation to make reasonable adjustments to the design of work and work processes to accommodate individuals' differing capabilities. This is consistent with a growing understanding, supported by empirical evidence, that well-designed work can improve worker health and well-being, but poorly designed work is damaging to both physical and mental health. Traditionally, PTD has focused on product design, and therefore, there has been less emphasis on the process design. However, as we saw, the Australian Work Health and Safety Strategy calls for consideration of both product and process design. In fact, these two aspects are highly interrelated in construction. Research evidence from the construction industry indicates that considering construction process design when making decisions about um, the permanent features of building or structure leads to achieving optimal health and safety outcomes. The reason is that there are more opportunities to modify aspects of the final product to enhance construction process and its associated occupational safety and health. I'm going to use a case example to show how revising the construction process in a project led to a rethink of the product design, in this case a building facade system, and as a result the overall PTD outcomes were optimized. The case involved the design and construction of a high-rise facade structure for a 42-story residential building. The facade structure was self-supporting. The project was procure, procured using a design and construct approach. Um, the client engaged an architect and a structural engineer to develop a preliminary design. The preliminary design indicated a sophisticated web of rectangular elements wrapping around the building. To keep the weight of the structure low, glass reinforced concrete, or GRC, was specified as the main construction material. A number of larger vertical frame elements were to be made of precast reinforced concrete. The structure was to be installed after the building was constructed. After the constructor was appointed to the project, issues were raised in relation to the use of GRC and the construction methodology which required workers to work at a significant height outside the building. Subsequently, the design was adapted to use structural steel instead of GRC. The revised design involved a safer floor-by-floor -floor construction methodology which allowed for the construction of building and the facade structure to be undertaken simultaneously. Structural connections were revised and relocated to be accessible from the floor slabs. In this way, 
workers could install the facade elements from inside the building while standing on finished floor slabs. And therefore, they did not need to work outside the building at a significant height. This is one example of how construction process design led to changes to product design, leading to better safety outcomes. But there are many examples of how construction process could be better designed. We found another example of good process design in a recent study of musculoskeletal disorder risk in the construction industry. Data was collected using wearable sensors while workers were breaking down the top section of concrete piles using a jackhammer. This work involved bending the back and the use of excessive force when lifting the jackhammer into position and when maintaining the jackhammer in position over an extended period of time. Workers were also exposed to noise, dust and vibration during the jackhammering. In this case, an integrated debonding material to be incorporated in the pile around the steel bars above the cutoff level before the concrete was poured. This would reduce the duration of jackhammering for each pile, but not eliminate it altogether. Also, to be effective, the debonding material had to be correctly installed when the concrete piles were poured. If it was not correctly installed, pile breaking would involve significantly greater time and increased injury risk. An alternative chemical pile breaking technology could be used that eliminates the need for mechanical breaking with a jackhammer altogether. The system shown uses a system of breakers installed at the desired cutoff position before pouring concrete. Once poured, an expanding agent is introduced into the pile through carefully positioned ducts which deliver chemicals to the breakers. The expansion breaks the pile at the desired cutoff position in the ground. The pile top can then be mechanically lifted off without the need for jackhammering. The use of alternative braking methods such as this eliminates the serious health and safety hazards associated with jackhammering and also potentially improves quality and production efficiency. From the early 1980s, Australian work health and safety legislation moved away from a detailed prescriptive approach in which specification standards required the adoption of particular technical solutions for work health and safety risks. It adopted a more flexible approach in which duty holders can decide how best to comply with broad-based general duties relating to work health and safety. The Australian work health and safety legislation includes a primary duty of care for any persons conducting a business or undertaking to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the health and safety of employees, other people whose health and safety could be impacted while working at their business or undertaking, and other people whose health and safety could be impacted by the work of that business or undertaking. Thus, in Australia, PCBUs have an overarching duty of care to employees, contractors, subcontractors, and other people who could be impacted by their business activities. The legislation also establishes additional duties for PCBUs that design plant, substances, or structures. In relation to structures, designers must ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, that the structures they design are without risks to the health and safety of people who construct and also who use the structure for the purpose for which it was designed. Importantly, the duty is also held in relation to people who carry out any reasonably foreseeable activity in relation to the manufacture, assembly or use of the structure, who engage in the proper demolition or disposal of the structure and other people who are exposed to the structure and whose health and safety may be affected. This means that designers must consider the health and safety of people who interact with structures they design across the entire life cycle of these structures. They must also consider risks to people directly involved in the structures, either as constructors, users or demolition agents, as well as others whose health and safety could be adversely affected by being in the vicinity of and exposed to the structure. Designers also have responsibilities to give adequate information to people who are provided with the design, including advice as to the purpose for which a structure was designed, calculations and analysis related to the design, and conditions necessary to ensure the safe and healthy use of the structure. So Payam, can you explain to us what compliance with these laws looks like in practice? Well, actually in 2014, we asked a number of the leading construction companies in Australia about their PTD practices. Here, you see a list of the practices frequently applied by the companies. PTD is mostly implemented as part of a staged review of the design process. 
The reviews are typically undertaken at concept design, detailed design, and at pre-construction stages. Risk registers and spreadsheets are mainly used to record the health and safety risk information and communicate it to other stakeholders down the track. Some companies have also developed databases of effective PTD solutions. However, we also found that sometimes these practices are implemented late during the design process, when often it is too late to make fundamental changes to the design. Because decisions are already made about aspects of the design and therefore opportunities for change are limited. Thus, these practices do not often deliver optimal PTD solutions. You may have seen this diagram before. It was developed in the 1990s and has been widely used in support of PTD. It's widely understood that the ability to influence safety is highest at the early stages of a construction project and diminishes quickly as the project progresses through the conceptual and detailed engineering stages. By the time a project reaches the procurement construction stage, the ability to influence safety has dramatically reduced and important risk reduction opportunities may have been lost. This theory was tested in a piece of research undertaken by RMIT as a subcontractor to Virginia Tech and supported by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. The research looked at 23 construction projects, 10 in Australia and 13 in the US. 288 interviews were conducted, 185 in Australia and 103 in the US. For each building or facility, a score was generated that reflected the quality of risk controls implemented during construction. This score was based on the hierarchy of control. The highest score was given for solutions that eliminated risks altogether. The lowest score was given to solutions reliance on personal protective equipment. Therefore, a higher score means that better risk control outcomes were implemented for a particular case. The point in time at which a risk control solution was identified and decided upon was also recorded for each case. That is, whether this occurred in the project's pre-construction stage or during the construction stage. A statistically significant relationship was found between the percentage of risk controls identified in the pre-construction stages of a project and the quality of risk control outcomes realized. That means the greater the proportion of risk controls identified and selected before construction work began, the better the quality of the risk control outcomes achieved. This evidence supports the importance of pre-construction decision making for the attainment of technological risk control outcomes, such as elimination, substitution, and engineering controls. These are the things that change the work environment to make it safer rather than rely on human action for their effectiveness. In construction, the design professionals are often more focused on the structural aspects, end use and operation of a building or facility but they are not always experienced in construction methods, manufacture, transport, installation, maintenance, and the associated occupational safety and health. Constructors, on the other hand, are responsible for the construction operations in a project and have a strong motivation and interest to ensure work can be performed with minimal risk to workers. Compared to other project participants, they also have a high level of construction expertise and experience. They can therefore provide important advice about occupational safety and health hazards during construction and ways to mitigate them. Similarly, subcontractors and suppliers of different components and material have valuable practical knowledge and experience. When this information is fed into upstream decision making during planning and design, it may be particularly useful. This figure illustrates this point conceptually. The red line illustrates the availability of construction process knowledge to decision makers as the project progresses from the design through procurement to construction. As can be seen in the early project stages, the available process knowledge is limited. However, construction process knowledge availability increases as the project progresses and increases dramatically at the procurement stage. The red arrow indicates the desired shift to provide greater depth and quality of construction process knowledge to decision makers earlier in the project life cycle, as shown by the red dashed line.
Now let's see how the construction process knowledge was made available during the design of the facade structure, which we looked at in the previous case example. As we saw in this case, considering the construction process early during design and revising the design accordingly enabled to eliminate serious occupational health and safety issues during construction. Here we have used a technique called social network analysis to show the communication activities between project participants during the design stage. The rectangular nodes indicate participants and the arrows indicate communication between them. The thickness of the arrows and the numbers on them reflect the average frequency of the communication activities between participants over the design process. The interaction network here um, shows that design in this case involved frequent communication between the design manager, the project manager, and the construction manager. These are the senior decision makers about the design, project planning, and construction, as well as the architect and the engineer. In addition, specialist subcontractors and suppliers were engaged in the decision making when and where their expertise were required. For example, the steel subcontractor and steel supplier were involved in the design of the steel members, the connections, and the frame layout. We also looked at the communication between participants when each design decision was made. This animation here illustrates how different players involved in decision making at different times during the design process and contributed to making decisions when their expertise were needed. We use green color here to highlight participants with construction process knowledge. It is interesting to observe that these participants were predominantly involved in making most of the key decisions. We often think of the design process as being very static and linear and involve participants from traditional design professions, for example, architects and structural engineers. However, as we see here, design is in fact more complex because there are all these different groups who influence design decision making in various ways at different times. And in this case, indeed, participants with construction process knowledge were particularly important and influential for achieving good health and safety outcomes. So we just saw how dynamic the design process is. Design involves a number of different decisions, and the decisions are not independent of one another. They are interrelated, in fact. So making one decision has implications for subsequent decisions. We tried to show this point in, in this diagram by the blue boxes and the arrows between them at the top. At the same time, the decisions are made by participants in the project. The participants interact and share information which feeds into the decisions. We have shown these interactions and the participants at the bottom of the figure by red dots and the arrows. Therefore, design is really a complex process when we consider all these interdependencies. We have got to understand that each of these participants have their own interests and objectives, and we cannot assume that their requirements and interests are all aligned during the decision making. We need to recognize the trade-offs that are sometimes needed to be made between the stakeholder interests, and consider the way that those trade-offs impact the PTD outcomes. An example of this is the trade-offs which were made between construction safety and NU safety during the construction of, the, of a train station in Australia. The concept design involved the construction of a new island platform built between two existing and operational rail lines. The design also included a pedestrian bridge spanning over the train tracks. The bridge provided access to the platforms through stairs at both ends and in the middle. Disabled access to the platform was provided by lift. However, just before the construction contract was awarded, a new government policy was introduced, requiring all new stations to include lifts and an alternative means of access able to accommodate a standard ambulance trolley. To fulfill this requirement, the design was modified at a late stage to include a ramp and other features, such as landings and throw screens. The late inclusion of a ramp triggered other, disease, other changes to the design. For example, some columns and beams were doubled in size, and connections were modified on site. 
Installation of additional large elements required extra lifting activities within the rail corridor near power lines, and workers had to perform extra work and use power tools in a limited space to modify the prefabricated elements on site. Therefore, to fulfill the end use safety requirements, the construction health and safety was negatively impacted. One of the challenges when considering the trade-offs such as that described by Payam a moment ago is that stakeholders to a construction project and even direct project participants do not always experience or perceive work health and safety risks in the same way. We examine the risk perceptions of occupational health and safety professionals, constructors, engineers and architects in relation to different technical solutions to a variety of different building elements, facade systems, roofing systems and building service systems. By asking them to assess the level of safety associated with each of these different approaches, we found some significant differences. For example, in this graph, you can see that for facade systems F03 and F06, participants' perceptions of safety risk did not vary a great deal. However, for systems F02, F09 and F010, there was a substantial difference with occupational health and safety professionals typically perceiving the safety risks to be greater than the other participants and architects perceiving the risks to be lower. Risk perception and risk tolerance can be influenced by a range of factors including differences in professional education and training, practices and norms, different project roles and responsibilities and different project interests and objectives. Subjective perceptions can influence the decisions that are made and different perspectives also need to be acknowledged and understood, highlighting the need to have a collaborative, inclusive approach to PTD to ensure that all key stakeholders' views are heard. Workers themselves whose personal health and safety are affected by decisions are a key stakeholder group. Unfortunately, workers are rarely provided with an opportunity to contribute to PTD processes. However, when they're invited to do so, effective risk control solutions can sometimes be found. In one study, we were using a tool called participatory video in which workers were engaged in making videos as a form of visual safety procedures for their organization. While making a video about the erection of a mobile tower scaffold, the workers noticed there was a short period of time during which they were exposed to an unprotected edge fall, fall from height risk. The site manager reviewed the footage and asked the workers to spend some time trying to work out a solution to this problem. They came up with an alternative erection process that used mid-platforms and horizontal members to provide edge protection and eliminate the exposure to the fall from height risk. The site manager commented, the previous way of building the scaffold has been custom and practice for decades. No one had thought twice about it, but once you saw it on the screen, it didn't look quite right. We just got the guys who'd been doing it for years to try and find a way to fix it, and in the end they did. This example shows the power of asking the people who do the work for their input into the design of practical PTD solutions. Well, we would like to highlight a few key points here. The first point is that design is always considered to be linear and static. But as we saw here, the reality is that it's a complex, dynamic, and multidisciplinary process. That it involves um, making trade-offs between the interests of different groups of stakeholders. Now, if we want to develop practices and tools to support the implementation of PTD in construction, we need to make sure that we recognize these characteristics and the way they impact the outcomes from PTD. Yes, Payam. And as our research has shown, collaborative decision-making and effective communication are important success factors for PTD. This includes the early engagement of participants with relevant construction knowledge and establishing processes through which relevant stakeholders can provide meaningful input into design decision, like design decision making. Well, we hope that you enjoyed our presentation on the Australian experience of PTD. And we look forward to joining you at the question and answer session that will follow. Thank you. Thank you very much.